All right, this is episode number 10. We Unbelievable. Did it. We did it. We did it. This is the end. This is the end of season one. Of season one. We had, we were thinking what to do. Yeah. Um, we actually have been running out of ideas. And there's things Slightly. that we need to talk about still that we promised and we haven't delivered, like the micro helicopters yep. and various other things. Yep. But for this one, we sort of decided we're going to talk about flabberless. It's a good topic. It's a hot topic. It's a very it's a hot, hot topic. topic. It seems, you know, we're here at the Mulberry Fun Fly beautiful, in um, beautiful, Lake, beautiful Lakeland day. or Mulberry, Florida. Yep. And uh, it's a beautiful day. Oh, yeah. We are just walking around here and we see more and more flabberless helicopters. It's crazy. It's, it's almost 50 like, 50 now, isn't it? Yeah. When you walk around it, it's nuts. Unfortunately. Are you a flyboard guy? I'm a flyboard guy. At heart? I fly flyboardless. I have two, three actual, three flyboardless helicopters right now. Fly. Nice. Nice. But I still prefer flybar myself. I really do. Okay. Now there's other, you know, it, it's, I haven't tried them all yet, so they all feel different. We're going to talk about how they feel. We're not going to get into specifics. We're not going to talk about which one's better, which one's worse. We're not going to discuss the difference in the features. Yeah. We're we're just we're going to give you an overview of some of the flabberless systems. We're going to give you explanations as to like how how you need to prepare to have a flabberless model, what yep. to expect, exactly. bat tendencies, how they fly, yep. etc. So exactly, we're going to go over just uh, we're going to highlight four systems, I believe it was. Yeah. Uh, we're going to highlight the V bar. We're going to highlight Futaba's new uh, CGY750. We're going to go over the Beast X Micro Beast and the popular Align 3G, 3G. system. Those yeah. are the ones that, when we're out at Fun Flies, we see these most commonly. So yeah. we're just going to talk about the differences in them, how you set them up, yeah. everything like that. We are leaving the Curtis system out. Uh, unfortunately, we, we don't have a Curtis yeah. unit to, the, to show. Right. Um, but uh, we've heard a lot of good things about that system as well, and there's yep. many others. Yeah. So Lots of them. Lots we of apologize them. for taking so long to get this episode out to you guys. Exactly. We've been really, really busy. Um, good news is, this is the end of season one, but yep. we have a surprise. We do have a surprise. Just keep your eye on the website. Keep your eye on our website, www.smacktalkrc.com. It'll be very cool. You got everybody will like it. Everybody will like it. Yep. All right, let's so, get this going. Let's Episode get it going. Number 10. Last one. Here we go. Okay, before we actually begin to uh, explain all the advantages, I guess you could say, and th even disadvantages of flabberless, um, it's important to explain or talk a little bit about the history of flabberless. Yes, sir. History lesson, I believe. What, uh, where, where, uh, where's, how did flabberless start? Well, from what I'm hearing from different people, the flabberless uh, has been around for a while. I mean, it's not anything. For many years. It's not anything new. I remember talking to Ralph Delugio and Mike Swift and, you know, some of these guys who've been in the hobby for decades, and they were saying that a lot of their scale machines and other machines, you know, Smitty was saying it back at home, a lot of their scale machines did not have a fly bar, but they just tried to achieve some sort of stability by having really, really heavy weighted wooden blades at the time. They put the CGs real far out and all sorts of things. But it's not until recently, I think it was, you know, maybe 2000, early 2000s into the, maybe 2003 or so when I think Mikado did it first. They, they made what's called the virtual flabberless system. There's, there's a lot of, uh, it, it's really actually difficult to find the exact roots of the first flabberless, fl flabberless control system because there's a lot of controversy when it comes to people claiming that they were the first ones to yeah, do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But the first company that I guess you could say that commercially and made it mainstream made it yeah. m sort of made it mainstream is Mikado. Yeah. There's no question about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, but 
like Bobby said, in the in decades, even decades ago, there were flabberless heads out yeah. there. And the reason for that is the guys that were heavily into scale, the, hard, the hardcore scale people, perfect. they perfect. wanted it to look as scale as it could. Yeah. So they basically had these flabberless heads, and because um, without a fly bar, the helicopter is so unstable, yeah. they just used like heavy, heavy, heavy blades. Yep. And blades that had a lot of tip weight. So yeah. like excessive. They were saying weight. they were using like really heavy like tape almost. There was like a, a metal tape that you could put on there that was real heavy. Yeah, I thought it was interesting. And that's how they were able to hover because yeah. if you think about it, I mean, you could literally fly a, a flyboardless helicopter without a flyboardless control system. Okay. But it would be a ridiculous. It's like, not fun. It would be a, a handful. Forget yeah. about three D. If you could hover it and fly around, you yeah. yeah. Yeah, you, <laughs> you would uh, you, that would be a huge achievement. So these yeah. guys used to hover and fly around these heavy scale helicopters with scale looking helicopters with these very heavy blades, yeah. and that actually helped them. And even up until recently, I remember there's a guy in San Diego. I forgot his name. He's he's big into scale, and I remember seeing him work on little micro like 450 or smaller size helicopters, even 250 size helicopters with like five bladed, you know flabberless heads right. and he was using blades that were very heavy and especially heavy towards the tip because mm -hmm. root weight is useless you yeah. know the only way to stabilize is by adding exactly. adding weight to the tip so um so we don't know the exact date when this became available um and we don't know exactly who was the first person who, or the first company or the first person to actually develop a, a flabberless system. control system right but we know mikado was the first company that made it sort of yeah. it, they were the pioneers yeah. when it comes to setting the footsteps that exactly. led into um, a mainstream. Uh, yeah, I remember thing. seeing like Andy Rumer, Urcha, 2004, 2005. He was probably the first 3D pilot I saw do any sort of flying fly yeah. barless. I remember I went to Urcha in 2004. I wasn't even like maybe even. I, I don't. Even he was think not I Burt Kammerer. I was yeah. not Burt Kammerer. I was just Burt. And uh, um, I think it was 2004 or 2005. It could have been 2004 that I saw a Mikado helicopter with the flabberless control system. And at the time, it was such a, you know, you looked at them and you were like so intimidated by the, the yeah. technology. It was yeah. like, why? You know, why do we need to do this? The fly bar. And it simple. didn't catch on for a while. I mean, we're, we're at 2000, I think. E or 2010, I think. Even now, it's almost half and half. I saw Andy Rummer fly that. I saw Daniel Jetson yep. do some crazy 3D. He was the yeah. first pilot I ever saw, uh, you know, do crazy stuff. Do yeah. this reversing stuff on the deck with the flabberless system, yep. or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Period. And then after that, uh, it sort of stayed there for it a did. long time, several months, maybe two, three, four years, where. Yeah. It was just the Mikado group, and Matt Bodos was flying yeah, flyboard less. Around with it, yeah. And you know, you would one see, or two guys here. And yeah, there, very very sporadic. You would see a guy here and there. It, it is not up until, and you know, I'm not saying this because I'm an Align guy, but I I give credit to Align because Align released the 3G flyboard yeah. system and made it affordable, included a head with it, and all and these things. And they brought it to the market. And they publicly. brought it to the mass to, to the mass market, yep. I guess you could say. And and from there, now look at uh, all the systems that exactly. are out there. So. Exactly. But uh, yeah. I, I guess it's a decent overview of the history of Flabberless. I think yeah. so. Did a little history so, lesson right there. Yeah. So we'll uh, go ahead and uh, talk about uh, the various Flabberless control systems and how they work and, um, you know, the, the nature of Flabberless. Let's Next. do it. Yep. Let's do it. All right, we're going to talk a little bit here about flabberless control systems. Um, you guys probably already watched, hopefully, the uh, Quick Tips episode I made about flabber versus flabberless. I explained a little bit about why we need a control system on a flabberless helicopter. But uh, I'm going to explain that briefly once again. Basically, a flyboarless helicopter, of course, does not have a fly bar. Why do we need a fly bar? Um, small machines, due to the size, it, it's actually a very complex, um, complex situation here. But basically, because um, small machines, due to their size and their scale size, um, they're usually a lot more unstable than a full-size, full-scale helicopter, and 
In order to make them stable enough, we need a stabilizing device. The fly bar basically acts as a stabilizer. Fly bar and paddles give the model helicopter, small scale helicopter, the ability to fly stable. Uh, in other words, you have enough control to be able to um, use your cyclic and collective inputs to guide the helicopter or the model to where you want to guide it to. Without the fly bar, we lose all that stability. Now, there's many different ways to regain stability because a fly barless remote control or model helicopter is inherently very unstable. Um, you can, like we discussed just a little bit ago, you can go with heavier blades and you can have, for example, blades that are very heavy at the tip. Um, for example, this is a 790 size helicopter right here, T-Rex 700E. Um, these are 690 millimeter blades, 693s to be exact. Um, these blades usually weigh anywhere in between 165 to 185 grams, depending on brand and so forth. You would need something like 250 gram blades, um, for example, to make this helicopter somewhat stable so that you could fly around, perhaps do some decent forward flight, even a loop and a roll and so forth. Now, with that kind of weight on the blades, you're losing, you're gaining stability, but you're losing agility. And what happens is now you have a helicopter that you can fly around and perhaps even do a roll, maybe even a loop if you get lucky, but you, you lose all kinds of agility because you have a very heavy blade and a very, very, very heavy disc that loads your motor excessively. So what's the solution? The solution to stabilize it is to add this control system. What we've called the flabberless control system. Um, what it does is it just basically does the same thing as your tail gyro, but it, it does it, it becomes a three axis gyro. It controls your aileron this way, your elevator this way, back and forth on your swash, and in addition to your tail, of course, if it's a three axis gyro. Um, and what that does is that allows you to run blades that are um, less heavy, in other words, about the range of weights that I expect just mentioned 185 grams or whatever, 165, 185 grams, and allow you to fly the helicopter in complete control. What the control unit does, or the flabberless uh, control system does, is it constantly monitors the attitude of the helicopter, uh, pitch, yaw, and so forth, and it makes corrections to make sure that the helicopter is stable. So um, this allows you to do 3D, all kinds of crazy maneuvers, Hero flips, what have you, without requiring to have a fly bar. Um, we're going to get into the advantages of this, and Bobby will explain this later. There's many advantages. It's all computerized at this point, obviously. Um, but uh, basically, that's the reason why you need a fly bar, fly barless control unit. You need to stabilize a very, very unstable system. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and show you um, some of the most popular fly barless control systems here. All right, we have, there's a lot of different flabberless systems on the market. I believe Bobby and I count it like seven or eight different flabberless systems that are control systems that are very popular. Um, we have four right here that uh, we're going to talk about very briefly. We are not trying to push a product. We're not trying to recommend a flabberless system. system. We're just basically trying to sort of explain or show you what's out there and uh, Ultimately, you guys have to make your own decision when it comes to what flabberless control system you want to buy and try. They all fly similar but yet different. And I don't think there's a good or bad way to put it. There's not a good or a bad system. You have to fly them, unfortunately. I know this is a very expensive proposition, what I'm telling you right now, but you ultimately have to fly them all to be able to determine which one you like because they're all different. Some of them are easier to set up, some of them are more difficult to set up but, but have more options. Some of them have better flying characteristics when it comes to say straight and forward flight, um, but they suffer when it comes to pirouetting maneuvers. Some of them are better with pirouetting and worse with tracking. There's, there's many different um, characteristics and it varies from system to system. So we're going to talk about four of them right here um, very, very briefly. We're going to talk about the popular Align 3G system, the Mikado V-Bar, 
and then Bobby's going to talk to you about the brand new Futaba system that's going to come out, the 750, as well as the uh, Micro Beast or the Beast Dex system. So first of all, um, Align 3G. Um, you can buy these, they come pretty much with the hardware as well. Not just the flabberless system itself, but you're getting the 3G unit and you're getting the head for the particular model that you want to install this on. So you can buy this from anywhere from uh, for the T-Rex 250 to 450, 500, 550, 600, 700. Um, when you buy it, like I said, it comes with a complete head, um, blade grips, everything you need pretty much, including the system as well. Um, here is the Align Flabberless system. It's basically a two-part system. It has a control unit that basically you use to you plug into your receiver. Um, and then it has your sensor. Of course, you mount the sensor like you mount any other sensor, like tail gyro sensor. This plugs into your control unit, and then you find a suitable place for the control unit, plug it into your receiver. Um, the Align system is very easy to set up. Um, basically, you just go through um, pushing a, uh, the button here, go through a couple of menus, and you're good to go. It takes less than five minutes to get it set up, up and running. I have a video on YouTube where I explain step-by-step -step instructions on how to set this up. But uh, a very simple system, very economical, um, very popular as well. Um, this also has a computer interface. So even though you don't have to use the computer, you set this up by pushing the button like I just explained. Then you take your computer and if you want to, um, you have a nice computer interface that you can use to set up all kinds of settings. Elevator, aileron control, total gain, gains, uh, the lock gain, I mean all kinds of stuff. I mean as you can see here there's a lot of different things you can use with this system. Rudder settings, you got all kinds of stuff. Um, so it gives you the ability to customize the feel of the helicopter as well. The only thing is that in order to use the computer interface and customize the system to your liking, you have to buy this little USB 3G link cable. I believe this is only in the order of about $30. Um, and it looks just like this. So what you do is you plug this into your computer, then you plug this into your control unit as well as into your um, uh, sensor and that's how you program the Align 3G unit. Of course, the USB cable comes with it, plugs into your computer. So that's it for the Align 3G. Um, very reasonably priced, comes with everything you need, fully customizable, easy to set up, very popular. It actually flies really well. There's, it's, it's a pretty decent system. Next one we're going to talk about is the Mikado V-Bar. Like Bobby and I explained earlier, these guys are the pioneers. These are the first people to actually make this system or a flabberless control unit system um, part of the mass market. Um, this is the new, what they call the new V-Bar, even though it still shows the old box. They have two different systems. They have what they call a mini V-Bar and they have a full-blown V-Bar. Main differences is the mini V-Bar. It's a single unit. Um, everything is self-contained, the control unit and the sensor. It's all within one single unit. The full-blown V-Bar like this one is basically a two-part unit like, a, like, the, like the Align 3G. It has the control unit, which is separate, and then the sensor, which is separate. Um, the mini V-Bar is intended to be used by, uh, with your electric helicopter. It's more susceptible to vibrations, so you really don't want to run it on a nitro helicopter. The full-blown V-Bar, which is this one right here, is intended to be used on your nitro helicopter. I have actually just install this just for testing on my T-Rex 700 and uh, as you can see see if the camera can get it right here as you can see that is the sensor of the full-blown V-Bar right here and that is the control unit right here so it's a really cool system um, it flies very very well however um, I guess you could say if, if you want to call it a disadvantage the disadvantage about the V-Bar is, is that you do need a computer to set it up. And basically what you do is you have to load the software on your computer to be able to set it up from beginning to end. If you don't have this software on your computer, you will not be able to use 
the V bar and set it up accordingly. So what you do, it's actually a very simple system. You load up the software in your computer, it's compatible with Mac as well as Windows, load it up and then you basically go through some sort of wizard, you push setup, this is going to give me a couple of errors here because I don't have it plugged into my system right now. But you click on setup and then it starts prompting you and asking you all kinds of questions. And it's going to tell you um, basically what to do. Like it's going to tell you where to plug in your wires, um, all kinds of stuff. And it'll kind of walk you through several different steps that are really easy to follow. Like, you know, how to set up your sticks. It, all kinds of stuff. It's, it's a very intuitive platform. It's very easy to use, but basically you do depend, you have to have a computer to set it up. So uh, with all this being said, we're going to go ahead and talk about the Futaba now and the Micro Beast or the Beast, Beast Deck systems. All right, so Bert just walked you guys through the Align and the Mikado fly bar list systems. So now I'm going to explain the Micro Beast, Beast X, and the brand new Futaba CGY750, the uh, fly bar list unit from Futaba that I've been playing around with this past month or so. So first we're going with the Micro Beast, or called the Beast X system. Um, I believe that Horizon Hobbies is going to be selling this soon in the U.S. Um, apparently it's becoming really, really popular. It's made by these guys in Germany. Um, so what it is, is if you want to check out the unit, it's very, very small. Um, it's very similar to the Mini V-Bar from Mikado, um, to where it's got everything kind of built into this little unit. It's got the sensor and the amp control box built in. It's got these pots on the front where you can adjust different settings. Um, when you get it, it just comes with, uh, you know, comes with various wires and extensions. Um, and they, they really do an okay job with it. Um, they, you know, it's a full English manual, full German manual. Um, and what they have is these letters. It's A through N. It's got these little different LED lights. And each letter um, represents a different part of the setup. So one will be, for instance, letter D may be uh, set up your pitch. Or letter, uh, you know, letter G may be... Um, you reverse your aileron direction or some, something like that. So that's how they chose to do the setup. And it's a very simple one push button setup. Um, you know, just like every other fly bar list system out there, you know, they, they tell you to strain relief the wires and all, all this sort of stuff. But everything's really built in. It's nice and compact. It's a pretty robust unit. I think this is some, uh, some sort of CNC aluminum right here. Um, they, they did an okay job with it. So that's the Beast X system. Um, it flies pretty well, actually, just right, just stock. It, it really does okay. Um, it's fine with, uh, it doesn't seem to be too susceptible to vibrations. I know that guys are telling me that, uh, you know, they strap it down real tough. But anyway, it, it, it's a good system, nonetheless. So next we have the, uh, I'd love to show you some sort of box or something, but there is none yet. Um, this is the uh, CGY. 750 fly barless unit from Futaba. Um, very few of us have been testing it. Um, Kyle Stacy, Matt Botos, and I have been testing this for the past month or so. Um, and it's, it's really doing pretty well. It's really doing all right. Um, as you can see here, this is a, uh, it's a system that's very similar to the full-size V-Bar or the Align 3G system, to where you have a control box. It says 701 because this is a test version. It's in the same exact case as a 701. But it, it, what it is is it's your amp box right here, and it's your sensor right here. Um, just a few different things about it. Um, you know, for instance, the mini V bar. For instance, you know, maybe on a 700 you'd be able to mount it up here, or your beast stack you'd be able to mount it up here. Some helicopters don't have a flat platform to mount up here. So if you were to run a, a mini V bar. Um, or the Beast X systems on one of the models where the front isn't flat, you know, you'd be kind of out of luck. So that's when you'd look into something to where, like, the sensors, you know, mounted, it can be mounted like a foot away or something like that. But with this system, it's very simple. Um, you do all your programming through here. With both of these systems, the Beast X and the Futaba system, there's absolutely zero interface with a computer at all. Um, with this with this unit right here, you can update it with Futaba CIU2. It's just a very simple USB adapter. You can update your um, GY520 with it, your 701, and it will be your 750. So you can update it with that. 
Um, just a few keynotes about this one. This is a hard mount sensor. You don't have to play with any sorts of tapes or different pads or metal plates, anything like that. You don't need to Velcro it. Futaba chose to hard mount it, which really does pretty well. They do all the vibration. Um, they eliminate all the vibrations actually within here, within the box. So it really does all right. Um, you know, as you saw with the Align 3G systems or the V-Bar systems, you fixed it with your computer and you changed your numbers in there. Here, um, with the 750 and the Beast X system, you just do everything on the units themselves. But that's a wrap up right here of the uh, Futaba and the Micro Beast systems. Um, there's other systems out there that Bert and I, we really aren't too familiar with it. Um, I think there's a Pro Bar, there's a Skokum, um, there's uh, the there's like a bot something, gyro bot. I'm, I'm sure there's all sorts of Heli systems command. coming out. Um, Heli command, all these different things. We just don't have that many much experience with it. But just from our travels, just from our travels, and you know, just going around to various fun flies, uh, we chose to show you these four systems because these are pretty popular. These are the ones you know right now in the year 2010. If you were to consider looking at a flybar list system, these seem to be the most popular systems. Um, one that we kind of left out was uh, Curtis's Total G. It's the same th sort of thing as this, as the uh, 750. It's got a governor built in. Um, it, his really does really well as well. So there's so many of them out there, but we really just wanted to show you kind of what this system and what this, you know, just compare and contrast some systems because everyone chooses to do it a little bit differently. So uh, now we're going to move on to our next segment. All right, so whether you're an adventurous person or you just feel like becoming part of the fad, at some point you have to decide whether you want to go flybarless or not. So let's just say right now you've got your uh, flybar helicopter, you know, T-Rex 700, you have your Vibe 50, you have whatever you have. And the latest craze is the flybarless helicopter. So sure, let's try it. So when it's time to go flybarless, here's a few things that you need to keep in mind when you make that transition. Number one, servos. Um, Bert and I both recommend, no matter what you have, if it's flabbard or flabberless, we, we recommend some sort of good servos. Now with flabberless, the beauty of the whole system and how it works is that you don't necessarily need to have a perfectly good centering servo. Um, because of the way the flabberless works, it'll really work just fine. But the most important thing with a servo when it comes to flabberless is exactly just like a tail servo. It needs to be able to be nice and quick with a lot of torque. Um, right now, my Futaba servos work just fine, the Align servos work fine, I'm sure Outrage servos, just pretty much all the servos now are going to be just fine for doing whatever you want to do with your flybarless helicopter. So that's just fine. Nothing at all right there. So you take your flybar off the helicopter, and most of the uh, flybarless heads right now are really just kind of a, a plug and play system. Right here on my 700, it was really just a plug and play system. Um, with this one, they chose to use the swash driver. This keeps it from, uh, it, it's, it's your anti-rotation pretty much. This, this allows it not to uh, rotate as it's going up and down on the head and allows your links to stay nice and straight. With a flabbard um, helicopter, this is done in your washout with those two pins. So that's all this is doing right here. Um, one thing that you really want to make sure of when you switch to flybarless is that you want to make sure that there's absolutely no vibrations in your machine. So if you can imagine if you've ever been to the field and you've seen a guy with maybe a filthy rich motor or just something going on in the drivetrain or something and you've seen the tail kick back and forth. So that's just a one axis tail gyro kicking back and forth. Now imagine if your motor is running that poorly or there's some sort of problem in here so bad. That's going to happen on all three axes of your helicopter. So when you're flying, maybe you do some sort of uh, climb out or you maybe you hit full negative or something like that, the whole model will shake in such a way to where it's really not that good. So try to get your model absolutely as smooth as possible. Um, another thing that's really important, um, find a level spot to mount your sensor. Um, this may seem really obvious, but we've recently run into an issue where one of my buddies was mounting a sensor. It wasn't an all-in-one unit, but he was mounting just a sensor. And in one of the models, the actual mounting plate was a little bit crooked, just ever so slightly. He had to hold a level up to it. And because it was crooked, when it came time for him to do a stationary pirouette, the whole thing would do some sort of a wobbling action. So just make sure that wherever you mount it, it's perfectly um, straight 
and flat, straight, flat, and just try to keep it away from uh, all sorts of moving objects like your starter shaft or something like that. Try to put it in a nice area, just like that. Um, just like Bert said earlier, when it comes time to go flabberless, find a unit that's right for you. Go with something where guys at the field are recommending. You know, if the whole field's flying V bars, go with a V bar because as your first time, you know, it'll really get you a. Um, there's more people to help. Um, just there's really not a bad system out there. They all do things differently, but that's really a, uh, a key point. The last two points I want to um, make to you guys is the servo wheels and blades. Um, servo wheels. When it comes to a flybarless model, um, when it comes, if you look at the linkage setup right now, there is absolutely no dampening between the servo, the servo to the swash, and the blades. It's all of the force is enacting on the swash plate and on the servos. That means that I never used to run metal wheels before ever, but I'll run metal wheels because I don't want them to strip. There's a lot of force coming on your servos now because your flybar would take that in normal flight. So. Especially in these Align helicopters, I've stripped a few servo wheels in a crash and you won't know it and then you'll go fly again and it'll be drifting on you and do all sorts of really bad things. Make sure you've got some good servo wheels and for the most part, everyone's running them in. We're trying to get as much resolution out of the servo as possible, just like a tail gyro. Um, lastly is blades. Bert's going to go into the next segment about blades. Uh, Flybarless blades are pretty critical on a lot of these models. Um, if you fly a few of these units with fly barred blades on a fly barless helicopter, they really may not work out that well, and Bert's going to explain to you why. So if you're going to go fly barless, make sure you keep these tips in mind, and you'll be good to go. A very important factor when flying fly barless systems is the blades that you're flying. Um, even though you can take just any kind of blade out there, put it on your flyberless helicopter and go fly, um, you will notice that the helicopter will not fly as well as if you had a very, or I guess you could say a flybarless specific blade. Um, the reason for this is like we explained a couple of segments ago, a flybarless helicopter is very unstable inherently and you need to do everything possible to help that flybarless control system stabilize the helicopter. The flybarless control system is doing the best it can to make the helicopter as stable as it can be, but the more help you give that flybarless control system, the better you are. So um, the first blade manufacturer that decided, I guess, went and released a flybarless specific blades blade was edge rotor blades um, and I have to kind of give them credit for that um, but there's many different flabberless blades on the market right now and uh, like I just said I highly recommend that you have flabberless specific blades on your flabberless helicopter so here I have a couple of different blades um, what Bobby and I fly but there's many other brands and I'm going to kind of very briefly talk about those um, edge rotor blades as you can see um, at first glance you can't tell whether they're flabber or flabberless blades. On edge rotor blades, the easiest way to tell is by looking at the edge logo. It's a yellow logo, whereas the flybar edge rotor blades, it's a white logo. Basically, the main difference between flybar and flabberless blades is, actually, there's three main differences. The overall weight is usually heavier on a flabberless blade. The span YCG, which is the weight um, between the tip and the root, um, is different. On a flybarless blade, the tip is heavier than the root. On most flybar blades, the root is heavier. So if you were to hold your finger like this and try to kind of like find where that CG is, you would notice that on a flybarless blade, the CG would be closer to the tip than on a flybar blade. Um, that what it does is it, it creates more stability because it's adding more weight to the tip. Um, lastly, the court YCG, which is the CG um, between the, the placement of the CG between the leading edge and the trailing edge is also more stable. It's closer to the leading edge on a flabberless blade. So don't pay too much attention to the weight. There's blades that are 160 grams, for example, on 690s or 710s. There's blades that are 190 grams, 195 grams. 
don't worry about the overall weight. What matters is how the CG is placed. Some blades are heavier, but have a CG distribution that counteracts for that excessive amount of weight. When I used to fly V blades, I remember we have blades that were very heavy, but they were so root heavy that they felt lighter than blades that were like lighter and had more tip weight. So don't really worry much about the weight. Just make sure you pick a blade. They're all good blades. They're all somewhat different, but they're all good. Um, so here's, for example, what Bobby flies. These are the Maverick um, G5 blades. Um, you can tell they're flabberless because they have a red stripe. The fly bar ones have a gray stripe. So they're, but, but again, you, you can't really tell just by looking at it. You would have to check the CGs and so forth. But your helicopter will fly much better um, with the flabberless blade. It'll be more stable. It'll track better. Um, sometimes I get a lot of emails about people asking me, I have this bobble or wobble on my helicopter. Um, that can be dramatically improved with flabberless blades as well. Um, weird tendencies of tucking or pitchiness and stuff like that can be reduced or even eliminated 100% by going with flabberless blades. So um, as for other brands, Curtis has now just released his flabberless blades as well, the Radix flabberless version blades. Align has their uh, 3G blades also. Um, of course, you have the Mavericks, you have the Edge blades. Um, I believe Rotortech, if I'm not mistaken. Um, SABs have a flabberless version right now. I mean, there's way too many different blades. Same deal here. It's like flabber, flabberless. What system do you want to use? It's really up to you. You have to try them all. It's an expensive proposition. You're going to have to spend 100 plus something dollars per set. Try them all, make your own decisions, and fly what you like the most. But definitely, definitely go with the flabberless blade on your flabberless helicopter. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about the mechanical advantages as well as the dis disadvantages of a flabberless uh, helicopter. Um, most important thing here, as you can see, quite obvious, a lot less parts going on here. Um, so when you go out there and you make a mistake, you dump thumb your helicopter, um, take a dirt nap like our friend Ray says, easy repair. At least you minimize or you eliminate everything that could go wrong with the head. The most that can happen here is bent main shaft, bent spindle. You might bend or lose the two main pitch links. That's it. I mean, it literally takes 15 minutes to get 10 minutes to get this T-Rex 700 head back up and running after a crash. So that makes everything really, really simple. Um, another advantage is the fact that you not only now not have a fly bar, but um, I heard a lot of stories about people flying their fly bar helicopters like a T-Rex 600, 700, snapping a fly bar in flight and losing a paddle, for example. And not only potentially crashing the helicopter because you broke the fly bar in flight, because you were too hard on your helicopter, you hadn't learned your collective management skills yet, or who knows. But now you have to spend another 40 or 50 or sometimes even $80. Some of the, God, I think it's a, Rotor Tech or Fun Tech paddles are like $80 for a set of paddles. And they're awesome paddles, but they're very expensive. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, that's actually a very big advantage here that you don't have to deal with that mess. Um, another thing is the pitch, how you measure the pitch on your blades. Huge uh, advantage for fly bar this time. This is actually a disadvantage of flabberless. You really don't have a way to check um, when you mount, when you install a pitch gauge on your blade, how to check for zero pitch. So um, thanks to Align, for example, Align provides this little thing right here. What you do is you unscrew your head button and you install this up here on your head instead of your head button and you put your fly bar right through it or a little bar that comes with it and then you use that as a reference for your zero pitch. Shows you a perpendicular angle here. Um, between the blades and the, uh, the head. But other than that, that's a little disadvantage there. But as you can see, there's clearly a lot of advantages of a flabberless system, mechanical advantages. Another thing, aside from having less parts and everything else, you don't have to worry about interactions anymore. Um, <clears throat> if you guys have flown flabber a lot, you may notice that you know, when you uh, apply full collective, full climb out, helicopter might want to pull to the right or left or forward or back. Um, 
you know, you might work that out by using your radio uh, mixes or your endpoint adjustments. You then crash it, you then fix it, you have to remake some couple of links and rods here and there. Next time you fly it, instead of pulling forward, it's pulling backwards. Now you got to redo your endpoints and all this and that. With this, you crash it, put it back together, you know it's going to fly exactly like it flew before. Nothing changes whatsoever. Um, so the consistency of making your helicopter fly exactly the same after every single crash, time and time again, is very important. Um, so a lot, a lot of advantages here. One disadvantage, um, like Bobby was explaining earlier, um, when it comes to servos, I believe that it is, even though we highly encourage you to use the best, best servos possible, it is less critical on a fly bar helicopter to use crappy, I guess you could say, servos. You can use servos that are slower, servos that, you know, don't have as much torque. Generally, those servos are cheaper. On a fly barless system, you want the fastest servo you can have. It really depends on the ability of the servo to move that swash proactively as quickly as possible. So usually the, the faster the servo, the higher the torque, the better. Therefore, those servos are more expensive. So that's a, a slight disadvantage of fly barless. But other than that, as you can see, there's lots of mechanical advantages. So there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't really go fly barless. Go ahead and take the plunge, fly flabberless. <laughs> <laughs>Alright, so we're about to go fly here and uh, when you get to the field with your fly barless model, you always want to check, check and make sure that your gyros and everything are working. Now with the tail rotor gyro that you all are familiar with, when you move left and right, it's going to compensate and it's going to try to keep you the, to, at the same heading. Now if you come check out my swash plate, what a fly barless um, gyro does and control system does, it does the same thing on aileron and elevator. So you can see here when I go back and forth, it actually compensates. When I go forward, it goes back. When I go back, it compensates forward. Same thing here with my aileron, left and right. So we're about to fire up here and uh, you always want to make sure that, you know, when you get to the field, check your directions, make sure everything's good and working right. And uh, then you can proceed with your normal engine starting procedures and go fly. All right, so now we're going to talk about the differences in a uh, flabberless helicopter when it's actually flying. Um, so the first difference is just an actual startup. So when you turn on your flabberless system, some systems take like 20 seconds to initialize. This one's pretty quick. This is the Futaba system. So I'm ready to go. You always have to keep it level. And uh, so here we go. Now Bert's going to show you what the initial takeoff feels like because some systems do it worse than others. But we always recommend with a fly barless helicopter to spool up and lift off right away. So it's kind of a uh, weird sort of feel in the beginning. Now, fly barless models really hover well. I think they do. I mean, this is almost hands off for me right now. That's absolutely hands off. Um, in FAI, for instance, they're not allowing fly barless control systems right now. I think because it's almost cheating. Um, a fly barless system will kind of feel loose around center sometimes or tight, just depending on your setup. Um, this system right here really feels okay, so it's nothing unnatural or anything. So I'll just do some of my normal flying around. Let's do some uh, big loops, for instance. Now with a fly barless system, what they really do is they track well. By tracking, we mean straight, um, crisp, big maneuvers. All of them really do track well. So when it comes time for me to do forward flight, you know, up to a stall turn, this is very effortless. There's no pitchiness or any sort of a uh, weird feeling that you may get in a fly bar. Now, what many fly barless systems do have trouble with is what Bert and, Bert and I call smackdown. So if we were to do various maneuvers like this, a lot of them feel behind or laggy or just some don't feel right. Um, this system that I'm using right now really feels okay. So I'm pretty comfortable with it. Um, but a lot of them will want to have some weird uh, issues maybe. Um, one thing to look for in your fly barless system when it comes time to choose it, uh, Bert and I will call it like an elevator acceleration. So if I were to do some like front flips for instance here, some of them will want to accelerate. And by accelerate, if I remain, so let's say our, my flip rate's like this, every once in a while it'll go twice as fast. 
and whip out. So that's obviously not a good thing. You don't want that to happen. Um, so we'll go into a hurricane here. Now on a flawed barred helicopter, right here, I'm kind of around three quarters stick. A flawed barred helicopter would be fine right here. Now with a flawed barless helicopter, when it's set up correctly, I can go full pitch. So right now I'm going full pitch. You can see my hurricane is much, much bigger. But it's almost hands off. It's very effortless here. Which is, a, which is one of your key advantages of fly barless. So, all right, Bert, we're gonna go straight away from us. So I'm gonna walk towards the camera. I'm gonna point the helicopter directly away and take my hands off. Now watch, I'm not touching a thing. Fly barred, you can't do that. I don't care how good your mixes are or anything. It's very, very hard to, knock that, to get that interaction out. So with a fly barless model, you can do things like that. And they're just very, very stable for the most part. So we'll do a TikTok, for instance. So we'll do a TikTok, for instance. Now, as I mentioned before, some of these systems may have like a lag in the elevator. Um, this one, they did an okay job so you don't feel it. One of the biggest differences in a fly barless helicopter is power. This motor is brand new. I think I have about six flights on it. And I'm not even trying to, to manage my TikTok or anything. And listen to the motor, it's happy. Lots of power, lots of power. With flubberless, you have more power. And because you're not swinging around a big four millimeter fly bar with some heavy paddles, you have a longer run time. So, so on, uh, Burt's, on Burt's 550, for instance, I have a fly bar in 550 and I get four minutes. His is fly barless, he gets about four and a half minutes. This being a nitro model, um, I think my 700 would probably get around maybe seven minutes uh, fly barred. I have almost seven and a half, maybe eight minutes fly barless because you're so much more efficient. Now, when it comes time to set up your CCPM, for instance, all of the control systems do it differently. So you have to approach it differently. But with this fly bar list, I don't have to do anything. I set it up and I'm good. So meaning if I were to do a backflip right here, fly bar list, it just locks right in. There's no interaction, there's no weird tendencies, nothing. So what Bert and I are trying to say is that when you have a fly bar list model set up to your liking, there are no, there really are no disadvantages when it comes to flying. I mean, look at the power here. Another thing too is like when I load the motor, for instance, watch, I'll start to load the motor if I can. It probably won't even load because it's so much power. When I load it, listen to me come off, it'll come right back. Let's try to load it. Right there, comes right back because you've got way less weight. So lastly, after we did our, uh, our flight here demonstrating everything is the autos. The auto capabilities of Flawless has, op has opened up a whole new level. So if I just do a normal inverted auto here, watch, I'll just slow the blades down right here. I'll slow it down. Watch. And then when it times, comes time to spool back up, they spool right back up because you've got so much less swinging mass. Now, Fly Barless 2 has allowed me to get away with ridiculous autos. So this is a new one I've been working on. It's a uh, very aggressive auto, and I don't think a Fly Bar can do this. It's sort of a uh, chaos in an auto like that. The landing's kind of rough. Um, I know a lot of guys like to do blade stops. I'm not going to do one here because I like my helicopter. But from what I've seen guys do, the blade stops and whatnot really seem to be easier. Once again, there's no pitchiness right here. There's nothing crazy. It's just a nice feel. So this was a, uh, a brief overview of a um, difference in the flybarless versus a flybar helicopter. For a lot of guys, for the smackdown and stuff, I know Bert really likes the flybar better. Um, once again, if you can get your flybarless flying exactly how you like it, the benefits are just so much greater than uh, a flybar helicopter. So hopefully these tips can uh, be applied to some of your research when it comes time to go to flybars.
All right, I'm going to show you a couple of brief things here uh, that are very um, specific to flabberless when it comes to flying. Um, one thing that Bobby forgot to mention before during our previous segments about things to look for in flabberless is the fact that your CG is very important. Um, a tail heavy or a nose heavy flabberless helicopter will just not fly right. If your tail is too heavy, you're flying really fast forward, you pull a little bit of back elevator, the helicopter will turn pretty much go into a crazy sort of 3D wall looking thing. So you have to make sure that your CG is as close to the uh, center of the main shaft as, as possible. On an electric is easy, just move your battery back and forth or move your electronics around. One easy way to check your, obviously the easiest way to check your CG is just by holding the helicopter this way. You see it's a little bit tail heavy because the canopy is not on. Um, you can also hold it like this. You hold it by the head, being very careful, and you let it go. The tail's going to drop now because there's no canopy. But ideally, you want to, you want the helicopter to kind of stay around here and not drop the tail. That's telling me that it's tail heavy. So let's go ahead and I'm going to show you a couple of tips when we uh, that are very specific features that are uh, features or bat things. I guess you could say that are specific to flabberless helicopters. Some of the uh, systems do it worse than others, um, but they all to a degree kind of do this. Um, first thing is when you're going to take off. Um, first of all, I want to clarify, I don't think a flabberless system is a good idea for somebody who's just starting out flying. Um, I think everybody should learn to fly with a good old-fashioned flybar helicopter. Um, you'll get a much better feel for the machine because you're more connected to it, especially when you're on takeoff, and this is why. Um, when you start to spool up, I'll start to spool up here in normal mode. Um, at this point, as the blades start to spool up, it gets to a certain point when the cyclic input feels really, really weird. Like right about here. I feel like if I feed a little bit too much cyclic, it's going to tip over and crash. I get a lot of comments about people running into this, especially with the Align 3G. The best thing to do is don't worry about the cyclic. I'm not even touching the cyclic. Just be firm, just, just without hesitation, get it off the ground and then get it into a stable hover. You don't really want to keep it, you know, uh, with the skits touching the ground, trying to get it off the ground very smoothly. You want to you be firm. Um, you don't want to hesitate. So when you land, so in other words, when you're right here, avoid drastic cyclic inputs. It's not going to tip, tip over. Even if it seems like it will, it is not going to, trust me. Just make sure you're light on the skits and then apply enough collective to get it off the ground, just like that, without any hesitation. On a fly bar model, you could take it off the ground very slowly and it feels the same way on the ground as it feels in the air. The flabberless doesn't because it's trying to feed input in one direction and it can't because it's not sensing that movement so the gyros can't correct for that. So just take off, get it off the ground and do your normal flying. Then another thing is your autos. When you're going to do an auto, I'm just going to hit hold from low altitude. When you do an auto, it gets to a point in time when the head speed decays when it also feels really weird. It feels like it's just kind of fighting you or something. It's really hard to explain. I'm going to hit hold right now. If I try to hold it and hold it right about there, it just it gets to a, t a point in time when you feel like your cyclic just for some reason doesn't seem to correlate to what the helicopter is doing. Um, the best thing to do when you're doing an auto is you do your auto and you try obviously the, to preserve as much head speed as possible. The, the fact that it's fiberless helps a lot with that. You're going to have more head speed. It's going to be harder to kill the blades. And then what you do is when you get to a relatively low altitude of a few inches, you just let it let it land. Let it, don't, don't try to bleed off the head speed when you're very low to the ground because all that's doing is, is that, that can actually cause the helicopter to tip over. Again, some systems are worse than others. Um, I know that the Curtis system that unfortunately we didn't have a chance to show to you during this episode um, has a feature that when the RPM drops below a certain level, it actually uh, lowers the gain on the gyros. So it feels a lot more like a fly bar when you decay the head speed. Other f systems like the 3G, the 3G is actually not too bad, but some of them like the 3G and the Mikado show it a little bit more. I believe the Futaba is also pretty good um, in, in, at not showing this. But uh, simple, just when you're going to land, like I said, just try not to bleat all of the head speed. Just leave a little bit of head speed. When you get to a few inches off the ground, land it just without hesitation. And when you do autos and you try to stretch your auto, be very careful 
careful. If you're autoing and you come to a low level altitude, like ground effect, and you keep going on your auto, if you try to stretch it too much, trust me, your cyclic is just not going to work and you're going to end up tipping over. So these are just some of the bad things about flabberless systems, but they're really not that bad. You can work around them very easily. But again, if you're a new pilot, I highly encourage you to learn your hover with a flabber helicopter because you'll develop a much better feel for how the helicopter shoot behave while on the ground spooled up and at low ground, ground, level, ground level or what we call ground effect. This is it for episode number 10. That was it, episode number 10. We hope you guys liked our uh, review of flabberless Explain what it is, gave you a nice history lesson. I yep. felt like I was in school there. Yeah. I was learning. Yeah. Learning. Which we will probably do an episode. We can't promise anything, mm -hmm. but we will probably do episodes in season two where we go into specifics about yeah. these units. Yeah, um, there's a lot of them out maybe there. Maybe do too. like two units per episode yeah. and then incorporate the other ones that we missed, like the Curtis and I don't know. Skookum. Or like Skookum. Yeah, yeah those guys. So, those um, guys. So, Check our website. There's Check the website. We have a very, very, very special surprise. Um, coming very, very, very soon. Yeah, it should be cool. Yeah. It should be very cool. So thank you guys so much for your support during season one. This has been awesome. Yeah. This has been great. We started filming in Florida. Now we end we season end in one Florida. in Florida. Absolutely. Next so year we're right. going to do more international stuff. Yeah, I think cool. so. I think we're going to be, I'm going to be going, I think we, we may be going back to Australia. Um, maybe Australia, Europe. we'll do 3D Masters. Hopefully, uh, Europe. Yeah. There's a few um, international trips, so. Yeah, it'll be fun. It'll yeah, be awesome. All right, guys. Peace. Thank you so much. Later. Can you hear me? You can hear the crickets. I know. All right, so Bert just showed you guys a uh, introduction and a uh, explanation to the uh, Align Flabberless unit and the V-bar and the micro V-bar. Mini <laughs> <laughs> V-bar. <laughs> Imagine if there was, was a micro V-bar. Oh, oh, you just hit the... Yeah. Oh, fuck. Oh, no, we're good, we're good. <clears throat> All right, so Beast just walked you. Beast. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Beast is fucking. Who's Beast, dude? Are you kidding me? <laughs> You're Bert, not Beast. Uh, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> God damn, dude. What the fuck? In face. All right, so Bert just walked you through the uh, Align 3G systems and the... Uh, <laughs> you're laughing. You're not allowed to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> nice fart, dude. That's awesome. <laughs> We're never going to get this take done. This and is I a close think one. to ourselves. What a wonderful world. And you don't have to line up your paddles. I know a guy that takes about 24 hours. 24 hours <laughs> to line up his paddles. This is a true story. You don't have to worry about that. Why does it take him 24 hours? Because he actually glues the paddles in place and he uses this sort of device that kind of like blends the two paddles together and some dynamic force alignment moon shining thing. You don't have to do that. So that's another advantage of Flabberless. <laughs> on the deck, on the deck, on the deck. Noise. 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 That's full collective right there, dude. Fly bar list. What a dumb word. If I had to come up with some other freaking word besides not having a fly bar, fly bar list is probably the freaking last thing. What a dumb fucking look. No, we're not calling it fly bar list. What's wrong with fly We're not calling it fly bar list. Less fly bar. No fly bar. The fly bar is gone. Fly bar list is stupid. We'll call it control system. We'll call it any of the... Fly bar list is a dumb, made up word. I like the trim. <laughs> Here's our trim. God damn it. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah!
You're a dick. Here at Smack Talk RC, we pride ourselves on the most technolo not technologically advanced and visually stunning graphics ever. We've discussed going 3D. We're going to get the glasses and send them to everybody, but we just don't have the budget for that. So we'd like to point out our specific, uh, you know, we like to shoot whenever we're at events and we do everything on location. You know, there really is no home for Smack Talk. Let me introduce you to episode number 10's home. We are in Mulberry, Florida, which is, it's kind of ghetto. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, and it's pretty ghetto. It's pretty bad. Look at the trim. We have a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the trim. Look at the trim. <clears throat> Look, we had, to, we had to provide our own light bulbs. This is a, like a 3,000 lumen light bulb. It's badass. It looks like daylight. So uh, if we pan around here, we have a nice mirror. You know, mirrors are sweet. Another light bulb. We have another light bulb in here. We have, um, there's two beds actually, so Bert and I don't have the spoon tonight. However, he does enjoy it from time recording. to time. I'm recording. This is the intro. I'm recording. This is the intro. I'm recording. I've been thinking this whole going fly bar list thing, you know, it's, it's like a fad. It's like the newest thing. Like everybody wants to go fly bar list. You know, it's like back in the 90s, grunge came in, Nirvana came in, smells like teen spirit. Everybody wanted to smell like teen spirit. This whole fly bar list thing, it's like everybody wants to be a part. But do you really want to be a part of this fly bar list thing? So you're like, yeah, let's go fly bar list. So you get fly bar list. You set your thing up for fly bar list. And you're sitting there on the workbench, like pressing the little buttons, doing the LEDs, doing everything the on the computer. And everything's just, it, it's sweet. And you're sitting there on the computer, you're like, fuck yeah, it's going to be badass. And then you go out to the field and you fly it. You're like, what the hell is this? This is a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the same boat as you guys. I'm gonna bury this bitch. I'm gonna bury it. Oh. The basics. controls the basics and shit. So we're here, we're here with our friend James. James is from New York. And if you thought Ray was crude, James is like Ray but like on speed. Oh, don't talk about my fucking little brother that way. You know, little, no, no cursing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Why are you sitting there picking your fucking nose? I can't curse. I know these times. Flyerless control system. So, what is flyerless? Why is there a fly bar? Why is there a fly bar? Jamor, can we get you over here for a sec? We, we pick, this is our friend Jamor. We picked him because he is a flybarless fanatic. Do you love flybarless? Definitely, man. I have some two in my leg. Are they two in your leg? Do you like fly bar or fly bar less? I'm old school. I don't like fly bar less. For those guys out there who are reluctant to go from fly bar to fly bar less, what do you say to them? Oh, uh, it's nice. It ain't as bad as people make it out to be. You know, everybody feel like it's for souped up 3D pilots, and I'm here to say no, that's BS. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Thanks, dude. Appreciate, appreciate it. Pal. Appreciate it. So anyway, kids, don't do drugs. You don't need to be part of the fad with this whole fly bar list shit, okay? I mean, it's really cool. It really is cool, so you should try it. <laughs> but you don't need it. So if you're still flying a fly bar, if Bert and I show up to XFC 2011 with a fly bar, that's fine. We're okay. We're just keeping it real. Peace.